Hello, hello. Yeah, 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 usual spiel about how I wish I could make videos more often, but life always gets in the way. Today, this was supposed to be a Halloween-themed episode somewhat, but whatever, you got it now. Uh, in... Oh, crap. I just looked at the calendar. We're back with Paleo Profiles, and this episode is all about Atlantis and or giant fish species throughout Earth's history. The oceans, rivers, and lakes of Earth have always been shrouded in a cloud of mysticism. Go to any village or town beside a body of water and you're bound to hear some bizarre tales and folklore about things that might lurk just below the surface. Japanese folklore speaks of many mysterious sea and lake monsters. The Isonade, or beach stroker, is said to have swam just offshore of western Japan. The creature was never seen in its entirety. A sailor would only be able to glance a huge fluke covered in barbs and spines emerge from the sea. This tale would attempt to snare unfortunate humans who sailed too far from the shallows. Namazu was a colossal catfish in Japanese mythology. It is said to reside in the mud under the island chain, being restrained by a massive stone crushing its head. However, the catfish's size was so massive that when it thrashed about, it created earthquakes with its tail. European sailors created similar legends about giant sea serpents, mermaids, and tusked monstrosities, which inhabited the far reaches of medieval maps and charts. The culture of the Solomon Islands believed an entire race of intelligent shark-like humanoids that used fish-derived tools inhabited the Pacific Ocean and could be found on voyages where they would try to kill unlucky mariners. The water with its murky depths and vast abysses has always been considered a pretty scary place to us landgoers. It represents something we have yet to tame and because of this, we seem to fear what inhabits that darkness. Our imaginations expect there to be some kind of leviathan residing within this alien world of fluidity and weightlessness. Heck, the Bible, as well as the texts of other religions, even hints in some places that in order to create the universe itself, God had to slay the physical embodiment of the abyss, often represented as a sea serpent, that existed before the world, and use its corpse to create the foundation for earth and the sky. Yes, I'm serious. And well, for the most part, our fears are to be somewhat warranted as science and prehistory make such legends and mythologies look tame by comparison. Paleontology has revealed countless real sea, river, and lake monsters that we know for certain actually existed. This will basically be a compilation highlighting various bizarre giant aquatic species from throughout prehistory. Mainly just fish. Hey, what's a prehistoric fish list without Megalodon? I've already talked a bit about this truly terrifying shark in the past video, but I'd like to return it briefly w with some new information. Megalodon is often considered by many to merely be a scaled-up version of a modern great white shark, with basically the same proportions, body shape, etc. However, this might be mistaken. The Pliocene Titan is solely known from its teeth and vertebra. It is true that early on, Megalodon and Great Whites were first considered extremely close relatives, to the point they were considered to be in the same genus. However, this is now considered mistaken. Megalodon and Great Whites might not have been as closely related as you might think, and the similarities they have with one another are believed not to be of close relation, but of convergent evolution. In fact, Megalodon is closest related to a now fully extinct group of sharks called the Otodontids, and Whites are closer related to Mako sharks. With Mega and Whites on opposite sides of the family tree, in this model, Great Whites are closer related to Makos than they are Megalodons. This information might have large impacts on how Megalodon looked in life. It might not have been the oversized white as once thought. Ododontids are, just like Megalodon, very poorly known outside of fossilized teeth, so we're unsure how they would look in life. They might have looked quite different than whites, however, judging from their distant relation. Additionally, as I have discussed in my Giants video, scaling up an animal and calling it a day isn't exactly how gigantism works. A change in size and niche for an animal carries evolutionary and biological baggage with it, and this stays true for aquatic as well as terrestrial organisms. A great white's body shape and anatomy is only used for an animal of that size and of that niche. The tail fluke, for instance, may need to be proportionally larger and wider than a white's to thrust such an enormous animal through the water. This larger, more crescent-shaped tail, as well as smaller ventral fins, reduces drag while swimming. This build is common in many large aquatic animals like whale sharks, whales, and tuna, and is likely to have been similar in megalodon. Perhaps a megalodon would resemble a basking shark or a whale shark more in its body shape than a great white. The snout of Megalodon might have been blunter and shorter. Megalodon did in fact hunt prey that certainly would have been heavier and thicker than a Great White's. The thing is, we simply don't really know how exactly Megalodon would have looked in life, and I think assuming it's just a big Great White is mistaken, and I'd like to see an in-depth discussion on what this animal really in life would likely look like. 
An interesting thing to note is I would like to add is the fact Megalodon would very likely be in the category of animals that reach a size where they are big enough to be their own ecosystems in a sense. Megalodon likely would have been a hub for countless parasites and similar smaller organisms, much like some whales and even some sharks are today. Shark-eating barnacles are known to embed themselves in the skin of lantern sharks. Remoras and other opportunistic fish species likely would have been constantly followed a megalodon throughout the seas. I bet a megalodon would have been accompanied by an entourage of smaller animals, which used it as an easy way to get a meal and protection. I would really want to highlight that our image of megalodon is changing, and it might not have been the super massive great white depicted in media. It might have been a weird snub-nosed creature with a massive tail and a skin blanketed with smaller organisms. The Kim Kim fossil formation in North Africa is probably the most fascinating fossil bed ever discovered, and has been shrouded in mystery since its discovery. Its story is one of a forgotten Eden and lost knowledge. In the now close to lifeless desert of North Africa, during the 20th century, the German paleontologist Ernest Stromer had discovered the remains of countless new and bizarre species. He had in fact uncovered the fossil beds of what was once a thriving and vibrant ecosystem a hundred million years old, unlike any ever seen. During the mid-Cretaceous period, 94 million years in the past, what would become Africa was as of yet unconnected with the rest of the world. The Atlantic Ocean was still young, with South America much closer to Africa than usual, and India was its own separate landmass floating out in the middle of the ocean. The Kim Kim Formation was located on the north coast of the African continent, close to the equator. It was a massive river basin on the edge of an ancient sea, crisscrossed with estuaries, swamps, and rivers. It was probably comparable to the Amazon River Basin of today, in its fertility and richness. And this richness allowed the primeval landscape to breed giants. From Stomatosuchus, a ginormous pancake mouth crocodilian, several monstrous fish species, and of course the massive theropods like Carcharodontosaurus and Spinosaurus, two of the largest predators ever known to man. Only scraps of information have survived concerning most of these creatures, however. The Kim Kim Formation has been shrouded in mystery ever since the Second World War, mainly due to the fact that most specimens were utterly destroyed by Allied bombs, and of what did survive are only known from a few teeth, fragmented bones, and scales, and as a result they remain largely estimates. Nonetheless, Kim Kim remains a fascinating paleontological marvel. The formation has been a bit of an anomaly in basically all of prehistory as far as its ecosystem and ecology goes. It seems to have been one of the most prosperous and fertile locations in the world, as it supported an absurd amount of animals of truly massive size. As this diagram illustrates, the average tropic levels, that is the number of levels in the ecosystem's food chain, in relation to the average body size of the members of said food chain is unheard of. The average body length of the fish in the ecosystem is much larger than anything we have today and surpasses some of those of seas and oceans. Needless to say, the fish of Kim Kim were oddly massive. The fish here are often the largest of their respective groups, and it appears that the Kim Kim created giants of all shapes and sizes. The largest known lungfish, sailfish, coelacanths, and bikers all called this river basin home. Probably the most famous of these fish, due to being the favorite snack of a certain Jurassic Park villain, no, dinosaur villain, is Oncopristis. Oncopristis was a species of sawfish, distant relatives to sharks and rays. And just as its modern relatives, it would have sported a tooth rostrum, resembling that of a saw. Modern sawfish can get pretty large, with some rare specimens reaching 25 feet long, but Oncopristis regularly grew to such a length. The rostrum alone of these guys was around 2.5 meters or 8.2 feet long. The rostrum would have been studded with electroreceptors, which would allow the fish to detect hiding prey on the river bottom. The barbs of the snout itself would likely have been used in the same manner as its relatives. When a prey item was discovered, it would quickly be torn to shreds. Imagine this, but several times bigger. Kim Kim was also home to a giant species of lungfish, Neoceratodus or Retodus. The naming is a bit unclear at the moment. Longfish, also known as salamanderfish, are one of us tetrapods' closest fishy cousins. In their primitive air-breathing lungs, of which they are named after, and their four-finned body structure reflects this. The giant longfish of the Kim Kim is only known from its tooth plates, but from them, we can estimate that this creature was huge and might have been man-sized in life. Due to its size and likelihood to breathe air, this creature might have been the Kim Kim equivalent of the Amazon's Prima. Paranogmius, just like many of these Kim Kim fish, is poorly known. Today it only exists in Stromer's original illustrations of his discoveries. All that was discovered of it was a very large compressed vertebrae, which was destroyed. Thankfully for us, a new discovery in the Kim Kim formation of a giant fish, which has been named Concavitectum, might be a close relative or maybe the same species of Stromer's lost giant. 
With this information, we can determine that Paranogmias belong to a now extinct fish group known as the... I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name because that looks ridiculous. This group is known for its strangeness and absurd body shapes, in particular Bananogmias. I almost said banana there. The concave tectum specimen discovered more recently was estimated to be 3.5 meters long. Stormer's original Paranogmias might have been even larger. A massive fish indeed. Odds are this guy was a gentle giant, feeding on plankton just like a whale shark. Another giant fish species that it lived in the Kim Kim was Ma Sonia, the largest coelacanth discovered. Coelacanths, aka not-so-living fossils, once dominated Earth's ecosystems, being incredibly widespread and diverse. Ma Sonia best illustrates this as it barely resembles its distant modern deep-sea relatives, and was huge, just like everything else in the Kim Kim. Last but not least, there was Ba Wittius, the largest member of the bikers. And, and yes, I believe I'm saying that right. I think it literally is pronounced bikers. I looked at that and was like, oh crap, I'm going to butcher this as I always do, but I think it's literally just pronounced bikers. Bikers are a rather primeval looking bunch, possessing fins that almost resemble those of the back plates of a stegosaurus. The bikers around today are often relatively small and live primarily in rivers in Africa. Just like lungfish, they sport a pair of air-breathing lungs, due to them being commonly found in poorly oxygenated waters. Bawitius was 9.8 feet long, and due to its size might have been mistaken for a dinosaur if you ever saw its strange body shape near the surface. This diverse population of fish formed the basis for the dying of the largest predator we know of, the famous Spinosaurus. Without these strange goliaths, the goliath of the goliaths though, wouldn't have been able to exist. Because of this, the Kim Kim appears to have been a rare chance in Earth's history. It seems an ecosystem as rich and plentiful as this only comes once in a while, as conditions have to be just right to allow animals to grow so large and so diverse. But such a perfect storm as this one might have occurred many times in the past, with different players taking up the roles of giants. Kim Kim was as close to a mythical Eden as you can conceivably get, with its estuaries and streams literally bubbling over with leviathans of all shapes. It would have been an angler's dream. The river monsters guy would probably have a field day with his formation. Needless to say, the lesser known and now largely lost members of the Kim Kim definitely need more love and attention. I totally wish Walking with Dinosaurs or some kind of documentary like it ever had an episode on the formation. I'm guessing it might be a little bit like the Walking with Beast episodes on Basilosaurus, just with Basilosaurus replaced with Spinosaurus and the sharks and stuff replaced with giant fish relatives. Leeds Ichthys is a relatively famous prehistoric fish that lived during the Middle Jurassic. It is the largest fish, excluding whales and dinosaurs, which depending on your definition of fish might still be considered fish, ever discovered. But as with most fossil animals, much of it is known from scattered remains of sections of the body, so these are largely estimates. As a result, much confusion has been made over how large Leeds Ichthys actually got, with estimates varying wildly from around 30 feet to as large as 115 feet. In reality, most of the fossils that have been discovered have been interpreted by modern paleontologists to illustrate that most individuals were much smaller than what most media depictions show. Ariston, the most complete specimen, is calculated to be 9 to 10 meters long, about 29 to 33 feet. And most other specimens are between 7 to 12 meters, 23 to 39 feet. However, isolated body parts have been discovered and might support much larger sizes. Specimen Galman V3363, also known as Big Meg, no relation, is estimated to be 37 to 49 feet long. The largest specimen ever discovered was NHMP10156, also known as the gill basket, due to the fact that the individual is only known from its gill basket. Easy enough. This specimen had an estimated 52 feet in length, and would have been by far the largest and the oldest individuals ever discovered, 45 years indicated by growth rings. It seems the 100 foot long estimates, largely based off of gill basket sizes, often seen in media depictions might have been miscalculations, as later paleontologists have determined that the gill basket grows disproportionately in size. Even so, these more conservative estimates paint a picture of a massive animal nonetheless. Lidexes was part of an extinct group of ray fishes, known as the Pachycodormidids. They were a rather unusual group, and their relationship to other fish at the moment is unclear. As you probably know, Lidixis was a filter feeder and occupied a niche similar to that of baleen whales of today, as gentle giants drifting about the warm Jurassic seas. 
These much more fishy whales might have been the prey of plesiosaurs like Lyplerodon, which was not as big as it is in Walking with Dinosaurs, as it is closer in size to a great white shark in real life than a megalodon. Lysixes also coexisted with strange marine crocodilians that convergently evolved flukes like dolphins. And even more interestingly, there is evidence that Metrorhynchus fed on Lysixes. A tooth was discovered embedded in the bone of a Lethixes, meaning that scene in Chased by Sea Monsters is actually surprisingly accurate. Lethixes are an almost mythical animal when you think about it. The gargantuan fish is the real Behamut of medieval Islamic cosmology, or Aspidishalon, a giant fish creature as big as an island, or Hydrus from Shadow of Colossus. One can only dream of seeing a sea teeming with these giants, swimming just below the surface. And last, but certainly not least, we have the strange, the bizarre, the crazy Helocoprine. Again, like Megalodon or Lysicthes, odds are is that you have heard of this guy. It's a weird shark-looking thing with an awesome saw thing on its mouth. However, just like Meg and Lead, odds are your image of this creature is wrong to some extent. Most media depictions of Heli depict it as a giant shark with a myriad of different theories regarding the placement of its bizarre spiral tooth whirl thing, and this was to be expected. As of until 2013-ish, we really didn't have a good idea of what Helicoprine looked like in life, due to the fact all we had were these weird buzzsaw-like things and nothing else. So what the hell Caprine did they look like? Ow, just saying that pun hurt me. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry about that. Well, we finally got a good idea of what Helicoprines look like with the discovery of a new specimen with a jawline preserved around the infamous saw tooth whirl thing. Paleontologists were able to discover that the tooth structure grew inside the cartilaginous lower jaw of the animal. The upper jaw was toothless. This discovery made basically almost every depiction of Helicoprines inaccurate and illustrated that the teeth likely were used when slicing cephalopods in small fish with repeatedly slashing its lower jaw and forcing the bits into the back of the throat. Unlike sharks, these jaws would not shed and grew in curved brackets. Additionally, it was discovered that Helicoprion's closest relatives were not sharks, but in fact chimeras, a distant relative to sharks, rays, and sawfish. Like their sharky cousins, they possess cartilaginous skeletons, which is probably why for the longest time we didn't know what Heli looked like at all. The only surviving members of this group are ghost sharks, ratfish, and spookfish, which nowadays are restricted to the abyss. But as Helicoprions illustrate, this group at one time was diverse and abundant, so odds are that Helicoprion probably resembled a ratfish more than a shark in life. Of these strange not sharks, Helicoprion was not alone with its strange tooth structures. A relative by the name of Ed Estus had equally strange scissor-like teeth, which belonged to an animal about the size of a great white. Helicoprion size estimates vary, but based on the largest tooth whirls, put the largest members around 6 meters, 20 feet in length. These giant chimeras thrived in Earth's oceans before the dinosaurs. Between the Carboniferous and the Permian mass extinction, they cruised across the vast Panthalesic Superocean, one of the largest bodies of water in Earth's history, and being many times larger than our modern Pacific. The end of the chimera's dominance was marked by the catastrophe that ended the reigns of countless animal groups and paving the way for their sharky brethren to fill the void. And well, that's all for now. Earth's waterways have been always fascinating to me. Perhaps the fish we have discovered only represent a pitiful fraction of all that once swimmed in their depths. So let's get out there and find some more. And with that note, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video and my return to prehistory stuff. Uh, next video I'm thinking is going to be me covering those dinosaur and human footprints walking alongside each other and seeing if there's any truth to them or not. Alright? See you guys. Thanks for watching.